but it will just be malicious, right? So the, the goal here is to acknowledge the fact that uh, we're in this community, that some of us are pretty good security, but some of us don't. And as a community, it's our responsibility to provide turnkey solution services for the smaller organizations, those who are run by your PhD students or don't have resources or don't have the manpower to run a full-fledged security team or have security products or infrastructures or whatever. And this is this is one of the components that we would like to advertise um, in the community. So we've been using this uh, for uh, nearly a year now. We demoed it uh, as a sort of early proof of concept at TechX last year. And now uh, we see strong interest in the community to deploy it, uh, in particular, um, well, in some Latin countries, South America, and some countries in Europe, and rents are interested in this. Uh, there is a strong uh, interest in the medical sector, surprisingly. So we are in touch with uh, hospitals uh, in Switzerland and in other places where they don't have the structure we have or the funding we have. So the idea is basically some good people provide a misp instance with uh, threat intelligence and the uh, less mature organization leverage the data by using um, DNS logs that they provide or they have. So either they run their own DNS service or they rely on DNS server that is provided by the community or somebody else. And what we do here today is just get these logs one way or the other, and we correlate the domains they result with the domains that we know are malicious in NISP. And then when we see this correlation, we just tell them. That's as simple as that. So we'll go through the details. Did I cover everything? I think so. All right. And don't worry, there'll be a demo. Some Russian, uh, or oh, sorry, annexion uh, ransomware group is interested in these two. So, uh, with all that being said, I'm Christos, by the way. Uh, today, we'll, we'll be covering uh, how PDNSSOC operates on correlating both requests and responses of DNS, the visibility, at least, that we have on v DNS logs, with uh, MISP threat intelligence. First, we're going to have a small DNS primer. I'm not Tannenbaum. Uh, this is literally... Uh, just the basics that you need for uh, this presentation. Then we're going to uh, walk through the MISP uh, operation model, the uh, uh, MISP functionality. Then we're going to talk about PDNS SOC. Then the different ways that we offer for deployment, because we are targeting small organizations, but not only. It uh, depends on which side of uh, uh, scale and resources uh, an organization resides at. Then we're going to uh, present a simulation of a detection of a real ransomware uh, case and how this would be detected using uh, the uh, logs that we get in PDNSOC. Then we're going to talk about uh, a, a term that is of huge concern to us, which is uh, uh, the privacy of the clients and different ways that you can ensure this or you can relax concerning where you are deploying uh, our sensor. Afterwards, we're going to talk about uh, fine tuning uh, of the uh, deployment and then our current status and our ambitious future goals. So, and by the way, sorry, you, you said I should say, tell them that this is an interactive session. So if you have questions, please interrupt. Uh, we don't like public speaking. Uh, we like everybody. So just that making like a community thing where we ask, you ask questions and we do something pretty interactive. As you will see later on, uh, we are already deploying this in multiple organizations, but we still value feedback from the user community. And this is because we are in the state that we are constantly uh, fine tuning our implementation to serve your needs, basically. So some DNS basics. We, what logs are we operating on? Literally, what happens when uh, somebody tries to access, for example, example.com, is that their uh, local host is uh, accessing their the recursive resolver, whether this is local or not. Uh, the recursive resolver hosts some cast entries. And uh, if something is not found in CAS, then uh, the root server is contacted. Then afterwards, the TLD one is contacted. Then finally, the authoritative one is uh, contacted. And then. Uh, the client is finally uh, receiving the answer to their queries, whether this is cast or not. From all of those uh, different um, steps, uh, what we should care about is the initial query and the uh, authoritative answer. 
This summarizes the information that we can act upon and correlate with our threat intelligence. So there are different ways to get those logs. And there are, of course, you can get the logs from your DNS server implementation, whether this is bind, whether this is power DNS or unbound, name it. Uh, but the problem with this approach is that in most of the cases, uh, information is missing. Uh, uh, DNS-specific information is missing. This is only the real basics that you can have. And if we reside on writing those logs to uh, actually any input uh, uh, device, then in the end, the performance of the DNS server is constrained by the performance of our I.O. And this is actually a real problem because whenever something is wrong with network, the first point to look at, and the first thing to blame is DNS. Uh, so this is not optimal. Then we can go async. We can use pickup or BPF. Uh, but the problem with that is that uh, those logs are complex to act upon for uh, correlation. However, if something breaks there, at least DNS is still available, and we won't lose our jobs. Uh, then we can go the uh, eDNS approach and have multiple packets, but reassembling the queries and responses, like having a full picture of what happened, is um, uh, pretty difficult. And this is all that we care uh, in security. Of course, we had multiple uh, uh, sessions already for Zeek. Zeek is an amazing tool, but in order to deploy this, you need to have a specific maturity level, which is not to be taken for granted, at least for our least mature uh, organizations that we are uh, targeting at. And last, we can use DNS tap. And DNS tap is an implementation uh, is an implementation specific way to get logs. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it's already uh, introduced in all of the major DNS servers, and there are multiple ways to filter out uh, PII or to uh, optimize the uh, flow. But I'm not exactly sure how many of you actually have heard of DNS tap or you're actually enabled DNS tap because there, in the past it was kind of difficult. Uh, nowadays it's not that difficult, but people still need to cut upon DNS tap, which for us is the preferred way of logging. I was going to say more loud. So Adam is, is raising the point that uh, there is a lot more uh, DOT, so encryption of DNS traffic coming up. So um, this will impact the landscape a little bit uh, or massively. So the way we get data uh, for things like PDS stuff will have to be uh, taking this into account. So basically, either we have to get it from the DNS server or from the client or from specific collectors, but uh, just sniffing the, the, the wire isn't going to be a long-term solution for network providers. So we need to have them to have the, the, the users on board. This is why we're here as well. And actually, this is um, uh, a logging implementation that is actually uh, included in the implementation of uh, various DNS servers, which means that we have more functionality available to not overcome, but supplement DOH, for example. So let's focus a little bit on DNS tab and exactly on the things that were already mentioned before. Uh, this is a, a log genera generation utility that is directly implemented into uh, DNS servers. Uh, this is the example of uh, bind. And uh, I blatantly took this picture from the DNS tab architecture uh, uh, web page. Uh, what happens here is that uh, our main uh, idea of getting logs from DNS is that we have an output from a, our DNS server, and then that's all. But this is making it pretty difficult for us to combine, to combine uh, queries and responses. And when you want to act upon uh, uh, that data, you need the full picture. You need the full action that happened. If you act only about, upon the query, then you're missing the responses and vice versa. 
So what DNSTAP does is that uh, it implements a uh, specific hook that is combining two queues, the queues of the responses and the queues of the requests, which means that the data that we get is aggregated data. It's data that is specific to an action. So it's, ac it's action-centric. It's not query-centric. Uh, by the way, this implementation is based on protocol buffers, which means that uh, there are various ways to completely avoid writing on disk. And this is our main concern because we don't want to touch DNS. We don't want to uh, impact DNS. So this is, for example, one uh, uh, a, a comparison between uh, logs from bind that are written directly to disk and or syslog and the logs that are generated from DNS tab. Uh, keep in mind that this is a kind of trimmed uh, version with only the important parts, but it's trimmed only because I wanted to fit both in one slide. Uh, so uh, in bind logs, we only get the query, we get the response, and we get, uh, in sometimes we get the responses. It depends on the implementation. And uh, we also get uh, uh, the DNS server that replied. So the reason why it matters is that you want to correlate uh, the domains to a malicious domain that you may know about from your MISP instance, but also the, uh, the IP that is returned, right? So maybe you have a list of malicious IP addresses and you want to match this. And it's pretty important, especially with cloud providers, because maybe sometime you want to make sure that an IP is matching a domain and the correlation between the two is quite important. And for DGA as well. So if we have like a constant changing domain, um, if they are using the same IP, uh, here we would see the difference. Uh Exactly. And adding to this, uh, here we have the full context of what happened during a, a client uh, query. You see here the operation is client response, but that doesn't mean that we get only response data. We also get all of the query data. And that's important. We only need this block of data now to be sure and be confident that correlating this data is enough, at least to have a uh, correlation with DNS traffic. Also, an important thing to note here is that, for example, you can get different resource records and you can also get uh, different data types. So, for example, uh, uh, malware that communicates over TXT records, this is something that you can catch directly with uh, DNS tab. And this is something that you cannot catch with uh, uh, pure and uh, default bind logs. One important thing to note here is that we have DNS, and DNS is uh, just uh, time series data of queries and answers. But in many cases, it's really important to also have the aggregation of this, this data. And this is actually called passive DNS. There are many well-known uh, passive DNS databases out there. And uh, what passive DNS is, is just a stored collection of the aggregation of queries and responses. And this is pretty, this doesn't sound that useful at first, but it's pretty useful in case you want to, uh, for example, you have in hand a specific IP and you also want to expand your, uh, uh, your threat handling to different uh, domains and vice versa. And this is useful because you can um, locate uh, different type of squatting uh, incidents or um, fast flux domains or newly registered domains. And this is something that we, uh, heavily used in our daily operations, and uh, we also try to introduce along with our uh, implementation. Yeah, so for investigators, this is very important because once you uh, receive a hit of a domain or an IP, you can see all the history, and you can start investigating what kind of activity is associated to that, how has it changed, and it gives you a much better overview about what has been going on and what can be um, the activity associated to that uh, specific hint. Going forward, let's uh, introduce our threat intelligence sharing uh, uh, tool uh, that we actually tightly bound with our implementation of PDNSOC for various reasons. So who has heard of MIST before? Okay. We are doing, uh, if I understand correctly your question, we are doing the correlation much later uh, in our infrastructure. So we are not, if we did the correlation directly on the DNS server, whatever optimization we wanted to do by introducing DNS tab, 
would be gone because we are adding more uh, CPU cycles to something that we shouldn't touch in the first place. Availability of DNS is far more important for many organizations. So initially we were playing like clowns with test DNS servers and then we get to run this on a, on a DNS server used in production by uh, 50 hospitals. And then it became clear that if that machine crashed or over was overloaded because of our thing, that would be really bad. So we try to be like the least impactful possible, go mainstream, you don't have to patch anything, it's just very low impact on the machine, right? That's super crucial. And all the processing creation we do somewhere else later on. Well, so MISP has been already mentioned many times during this conference. Um, it's widely used. More than 6,000 organizations are actively using this on, on their infrastructure. And today we will not go into the detail, but we'll show you how does it work. So initially, we need someone like Chris, that has a lot of expertise in infrastructure, to deploy and maintain that, that uh, service in a virtual machine or whatever. Uh, then we have to find feeds, so we need to find intelligence to put it inside uh, our server in order to have like uh, more information about malicious activities. So it's feeds or friends. I mean, feeds is, uh, is a concept that is very US centric, which is why you mentioned it here. But it's more like correlation, sorry, con connection with other MISP instances. Like how is his own? I have my own, and then we decide to share some of the attributes and events we have in MISP together because we work together. Exactly. So uh, it's exactly this. So we have feeds, but we also have all these connections to our partners that will share intelligence. And actually, um, this is the important one. So the feeds are very general. We, we can get it from providers, from vendors, etc., etc. But our friends are the ones that, we will, that will filter this information for us, that will give us a specific intelligence for our community, etc., etc. So this is the really the ones that you want to get. And at the end, of course, like intelligence on a box doesn't uh, have much utility, right? So then we use this information on our um, systems in order to protect the infrastructure of the organization. So let's see a, a real case, like uh, as an incident response team, how would it work? Well, so first we would uh, have detection systems. So we would have like a hint on a firewall alert or something, and it tell us, hey, there is an IP, a domain, uh, maybe a file name associated, and a hash. Uh, okay, so you have this information, but you need to understand what's that, right? So then you put it together, and you try to understand, you analyze it, and you try to understand what is this about. So at this point, you can say, okay, so um, this, the file with this file name and with this hash was downloaded from a specific IP or that was associated to the domain and the date. Once you have this information, you would share it to MISP. So, and here, since we have other partners that may have also have um, some co um, additional information to that, may add uh, uh, information to what we found, or they can have like different perspectives. So maybe um, it's not the same domain, maybe it's not the same IP, but similar uh, similar uh, situations. And then they, we correlate all these events and then we get a conclusion. So uh, there was a group that was targeting research and education and was trying to deploy malware. So now the only thing missing is that we will have to implement this on our systems in order to detect this file on our EDRs. EDRs, we will have to detect these connections on our uh, NIDS, and then if there is uh, an email, we can also have all the email security. So just a big difference between flat feeds that you would get from your regular vendors. In MIST, there are two concepts which are crucial. The first one is contextualization. Like you want to know how you um, all the elements connect together and if it's linked to things you've seen before. So it's very TTP based. And the, um, the other aspect is enrichment. So you try to enrich data with more, uh, like, um, uh, give it more meaning, basically, so that you can uh, interpret the data and make you uh, action it more easily. So let's see an example. OK, so this is um, how it looks like MISP, for those that uh, have never seen it. So what we are going to do is that we are going to create the event that we just made. Yeah. Sure. yeah it's going through Zoom, and it's, uh, it's really uh, yeah, anonymizing a lot. Oh. Thank you. OK, so um, here now we, we will add an event. The first thing that we say is, OK, one event usually is associated to a malicious activity. So in this case, it's, it's this specific connection. So we'll say, OK, um, this is the day that that. And then we will provide for now only to our organization, because we, we are still investigating. And we will say, OK, so the analysis is ongoing and the event info. So since we have investigated a lot, this is, wow, 
we have reversed the pillow and you say, oh, this is a ransomware. Yeah, we will. Uh, ransom. Are you doing it in the virtual machine, pal? No. This is ransomware. Um, and then we can say, for example, like uh, uh, ransom activity, activity on our, well, on our demo. Okay. So uh, then here we could associate to another event. So, but this, uh, by submitting this, now this is created. Um, so the first thing that we could do is to say, okay, so we can add tags. So what this is about. So then other organizations will know um, what is associated. So the first thing we know is that the guys that uh, that did that is the black hole locker. Again. Again. Uh, we also know that it's and they are good. research and education, um, ransomware, um, TLP. We can add the TLP. So TLP armor, for example, PAP, et cetera, et cetera. So once we have all these, uh, all these tags created, <clears throat> here we, we will see easily the context of, of this event. So anyone uh, accessing this will know what this is about. So, so now we have the event itself. So what we are going to create is the attribute. So we, we want to add the domain, the IP, et cetera, et cetera, that we, that we detected. OK, so first of all, network activity, um, a domain, malicious. Com. Contextual. So usually we, we put two things here, how we detected it and what activity it's associated. So we, we could say a firewall alert and downloading, downloading payload. And then here, this is an important step. So we say A. Payload, yeah. Okay. Um, so on here, if we enable this, it means that any institution, any organization that will see this malicious should block it automatically. So we don't want Google.com to be here. Um, and then we can see like when it was seen first time, last time, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can put that this was seen today, etc. Wait, why I cannot see it now? Sorry about that. I have to uh, submit. Okay, so now. For example, this is a domain. That's fine. Now we could do the same for the for the IP IP destination. So this would be, for example, there is a reason for that. Eh? Uh, 69 and same. Hey, that's my home IP address. <laughs> we say today. Perfect. We could copy here and put it as a. As a... Okay. So now. Um, here we could add also the, the the payload itself, so the binary that we have found, uh, the hash, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for now, we will keep this, and then the only missing thing is that this is not published. So now it, it's only on the platform. So if we want on our systems to be uh, visible, we will publish. Okay. So now if we refresh, all set. So now it's in our organization. So we would continue the investigation. So during the forensics, et cetera, et cetera, any evidences that we would retrieve, we would keep adding here. And as soon as we are sure that this is the malicious activity, that we have all the context, uh, et cetera, et cetera, at this point, we will publish to all community. So we will, it will be distributed to all our partners. So we, we perfectly acknowledge the fact that uh, in most attacks, you want more, like maybe Yarls, al hashes. There is a lot more. But uh, the goal of PDSSOC is to take the low-hanging fruits, the domains and IP addresses, so a very sub-part of what we can put in MISP. But uh, this is like low-hanging fruit that we can use very easily with DNS uh, logs that we get later. So uh, for a small organization, there is a high benefit uh, in leveraging that data. Any questions so far for MISP? Everything? Yeah. Uh, questions about the DNS part. Is that out now? Or is no, now we will proceed. So now it was the context, right? We have understand uh, like how DNS works, MIPS, how it works, and there is one point missing. So what's PDNS SOC? So um, basically, um, as it was mentioned by Rowan initially, we want to respond as a, com a, a community, right? So we want to share information and we want to base this high quality intelligence as the main objective for our uh, threat intelligence team. Uh, we want to fast reaction. So now I have detected, analyzed, and everything, and I want my 300 partners 
to receive this, this domain and these IOCs and to block it um, a few seconds later um, while respecting confidentiality and also GDPR in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, we want to create a product that can use all these things with a minimal implementation, something that anyone can implement in a very short amount of time and without resources. So this was our, our goal. And it's not about blocking uh, only, right? It's mostly for investigation as well. Like if you've seen that IP, you have a problem that is maybe much deeper than that. So uh, you just don't want to put this in the firewall block list, but you want to have an alarm or an alert that uh, you've seen a connection. So the overview of our implementation. Um, our main goals are to uh, minimize, as I mentioned before, uh, any intervention on the DNS server side. We just want the logs. We don't want to create trouble or performance issues on DNS servers. And this also means that uh, we acknowledge the fact that uh, admins of uh, DNS servers, especially uh, in research and education, may not be exactly uh, the DNS uh, server experts that we expected. So we want the configuration of this tool to be as straightforward as possible. Uh, this also means that uh, uh, we want to, uh, uh, to standardize both the collection of logs as well as the uh, uh, threat intelligence gathering. So uh, we heavily rely on MISP for the uh, reasons mentioned before, and we tightly couple our uh, implementation and the whole PDN SOC ecosystem with MISP. All of our components uh, are open source, and our main intention is uh, to uh, build a community around the tool. And this is mainly because we can recognize some patterns of uh, uh, different small institutions, but that doesn't mean that we know all of the different contexts. And last but not least, we have uh, huge concerns with privacy of uh, uh, DNS logs and we care about the privacy of users. So acknowledging the fact that there are different topologies that uh, uh, could work with PDNSOC, we offer different levels of privacy, so we ensure that any collaboration will not be hindered by uh, privacy issues. And fun fact, sorry for the question, fun fact, uh, everybody who's been working so far almost had no care for privacy, so they just uh, shared raw log uh, for DNS, and. Nobody wanted all the privacy features we built in from scratch, assuming it was needed. So we keep doing this, but uh, yeah, finding people privacy aware is quite hard. Uh, you mean how we ingest the logs? So in MIS, you can very well have an, uh, build your RPZ uh, or export data to Zeek or other things. Um, so you could block that. And uh, if you control the DNS server of your community, this is the best. You block stuff that you want to block. But in many cases in MIS, this is not about the thing that you know are malicious, but this is the gray area where you want an alarm, an alert. Like maybe a, you don't want to block um, all the Amazon AWS, but maybe there are specific IPs you want an alarm on just to check. Uh, like maybe you have a download on a specific port that is associated with a hash. This is for investigative purposes. Uh, the black or white approach where you block or you don't block, this is not really the point of all of this. And most of the threat actors we see is they are just in between. Like uh, the IP will be or the way will be malicious for a certain amount of time, certain amount of uh, and for a specific purpose. And also, like if I can add on that, so the good thing of MISP is that you can also filter based on the tags. So we can say, uh, so anything that is ransomware, uh, anything that is last month, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these I want to be blocked. Everything else, it goes to my um, like operational team, and they will verify and then block it manually with a, just a check or whatever. But the good thing is that you can have multiple layers of filtering. So then you make sure that for RPZ, you don't want to block automatically. You want to, yeah. So you can use uh, an, the API, for example. Yeah. Like you can reason. export. You can export directly. Uh, create RPZ for MIS. Again, that's a very unusual um, scenario. I mean, usually people get their own feeds, they put in RPZ directly, they don't have to go through MIS. Uh, going via MIS from the beginning RPM would be uh, not an intended usage.
So uh, MISP, as I was saying, is that it's a, the expression of a trust relationship. So you have your own MISP, I have my own. We build a trust relationship and we say, okay, I really trust you a lot or I trust you for certain topics or with some TLP or something like this. And you configure, we configure our respective instances um, in that respect, basically. But the sync is via an API, uh, we can token. Yeah, this is basically, uh, yeah, you have an uh, authenticated connection between the MISP instances and then you share specific, yeah. Yeah, so as far as saying, this is basically uh, REST APIs between the two uh, instances uh, and then the API key and then tags and filters and, and, and rules with, with pushing to which instance. No, no, go ahead, please finish. Both. So you can decide, okay, you are an ISAC, I'm safer and we have mature communities and we want to synchronize our MISP instances and make it happen via very fine-grained rules. Uh, or, uh, well, uh, Krista's going to work uh, with an ISAC uh, in his little island, uh, like a university, and you will give him API access to uh, the MISP instance in an ISAC with some specific permissions. And you can have even different communities associated for, and you can also use the tags to push in different communities. So you say, if I have like this research and education, I push it to this uh, trust group. If it's like defense, I push it to this that trust group. So you can also select to who you share all this intelligence. So although in reality, uh, the models are really very, very simple, uh, MISP allows very complex uh, schema, whereby as far as saying that maybe you share things with me, and if it has a specific tag, I could share it again with you later as a sort of uh, third party sharing. Yeah. So it's, it's just how, what Pa was saying earlier on you defined uh, the sharing rules uh, at the beginning. And in addition, when you configure the, the, uh, the, the sharing with other MISP instances, there are other uh, rules that go in place. So usually we try to keep, it, keep things very simple because when you start to have like 15 MISP instances talking together in different communities, it can be tricky. But if you really want to go crazy, you can really have a very, very fine grained and complex rules. So the good thing of, of MISP is that you can, so for example, you can add attributes that are very detailed. So for example, if we add a domain, then maybe there is an action all to our uh, Zeek instance to block that specific domain. But if you may add an, a URL, so then it's only that specific URL that would match with the IOC and maybe this is the only part that you want to block. So this will depend on the rules that the organization will apply underneath but you can have like very detailed information for each IOC. So it's, it's actually a very good question. I mean, this is why we have MISP and not just feeds. If you put your, uh, I don't know, uh, chicagochronicles.com, then you will have a lot of alarms. But if you put uh, chicagochronicles.com slash upload slash root.exe, uh, then it will be a bit more uh, specific. And then you should not expect people to download an exe file from a newspaper. So you put that on this in, in, in MISP, and whenever in PDNS talk or anything which is just IP or domain based, you see an alarm, then you can go in the context and immediately see, okay, if I see a download of this file name and file hash and URL, I know I have a problem. If I see just random HTML content, okay, false positive or I can ignore it. I took an extreme example, but just to show the, 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 the point is that you don't, uh, you have more context in the event or you should have more context in the event to allow you to make a determination. So for all the investigations, this is very important because in MISP, you will find not only specific indicators of compromise, but also it may be like a screenshots, it may be like comments, it may be like uh, ideas, rules. So many different things that it's only to provide the investigator all the idea about this specific attack. So uh, there are uh, some lists that are publicly available that you could also consume with different other tools. But this kind of defeats the purpose of MISP because of MISP you want sector specific, you want fine grained, you want filtered data. 
So it's better to build collaborations and sync with different MISP instances than consuming public feeds. So MISP is a tool. It's empty. When you, you get it, you have nothing inside. So you can get for uh, you can go for some public available feeds, but that would be stupid. You will have lots of false positive, and you will hate MISP and the whole idea. The idea is that you make friends, you decide to share threat intel, and you use MISP as a vector to do it. So if you, are, you start with nothing, the best you can do is make friends who already have a MISP instance, and that would be happy to share with you some of their events. Um, depending on the trust relationship we have with, with them. So the typical scenario for um, an abstract, actually, scenario of uh, PDN shock deployment is that there is a client uh, 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 issuing a query, a DNS query. Then, uh, of course, the DNS server will act exactly as before, but we will be having our uh, collector uh, collecting the uh, traces of this uh, query and uh, as well as the reply and uh, pushing the logs to uh, our uh, correlation engine, which is uh, the engine with a pretty interesting unicorn logo here. And uh, the result of this is that uh, our correlation with our threat intelligence sources, which would be, could be one misprecedent or several, uh, would result in different types of alerts. This is actually the only important slide today. And is uh, related to the question you were asking. So basically, PDNSOC is the actionable after MISP. So basically, uh, is the, the one that it takes your logs, it makes the correlation with MISP, and it generates the alerts. So it's the glue uh, of these different systems. So let's talk about the different deployment scenarios now that we have the abstract view of uh, how PDNSOC is uh, built upon. So. Um, we are collaborating with many different organizations, and the needs and the deployment models of each organization are very different. Um, so we wanted to consider like different possibilities, different size of organizations, different needs. So basically, here we have three scenarios. So let's imagine that we are in, at Berkeley, and Berkeley has a specific lab. This lab has no expertise in IT, has no resources to manage any computing source, so they have their own um, laptops, and they use the DNS uh, resolver of Berkeley to do all, all the resolutions. So what is going to happen is that we will use, as, as Christos was saying, we will use the DNS to forward the DNS logs to our correlation engine, and then, then we will trigger the alerts. Second scenario is that there is a lab with a bit more expertise, so they are hosting their uh, DNS server. This is usually the case uh, on, on physics and, uh, and experiments like the one we treat. So they are using their, their DNS servers. So basically, uh, they have expertise, but they have no security resources. They have no security team, and they don't want to have it. So basically, what they are going to do is, they, OK, I take all the logs of my DNS server, and I send it to the central security team of the university, and you let me know if something is wrong. So basically, the collector would send it directly to the correlator, and from there, we will generate the alerts. The last test scenario is that we are on a mature um, lab. They have a security team. So basically, they will host like uh, all the, this infrastructure, so the correlation, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe the friends that they have, the, this specific team, it's not like the same as the central university. So we were saying, here, we cannot have or maybe we don't have like all the feeds, all the friends that are sharing intelligence. So what we are going to do is that we will also forward the DNS logs to the central team. And if something is not detected here, they will let us know. So an example is uh, here, it could be physics. So the MISP instance could be run by another physics lab that said like Fermilab is running one here, and this is like the Berkeley physics department. Uh, but maybe central IT in Berkeley has a relationship with Renaissac, and Renaissac and Fermilab have totally different intel, right? And this uh, schema here allows you to benefit from both intel sources at the same time. OK. So now, uh, yeah, if I may, sorry, just go back to the last slide. And, and the valuable port point here, in the terms of TLP, um, is that once you have a detection, like uh, if the central services have some event in MISP that is coming, let's say, from the government or some very sensitive source, they don't have to tell the, 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 the user or the DNS resolver all the details. They can tell him, hey, you resolved that domain. That's really bad. But they don't have to tell where they got the information from, what the data is, what the context of the MISP event. So you can have very, very fine-grained detection without exposing the sources of the intel or violating TLP. And that's extremely important in our environment. Any questions here? Now we will go to a demo uh, on this slide. 
So we will simulate um, a ransomware group as we were doing before. So we will be a continuation and we'll simulate. Yes, go ahead. Let, let me. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, she, she can answer. Uh, so, uh, actually, this is only one of the deployment approaches, as you can see here. So, there is a, in, on the third lab, there is the collector, which is co hosted on the same uh, context with PDNSOC, with the clients uh, issuing the queries. But this is not a requirement. There are many cases that labs have uh, remote DNS servers that they are not uh, um, uh, operating. So this is also something that we can support. So the favorite scenario is that you run your own DNS, you have RPZ, and then in addition, to you send your uh, data to PDNSOC because you can do blocking and detection. The possible scenario is that your DNS is in the cloud and you extract DNS log the way uh, as you can, and then you send it to PDNS uh, sub direct. So, so if I understand correctly, send your DNS log, like your path to DNS log, right? And PDNS log, but just this event based on what others are sharing, does the correlation, and you can do whatever you want. Exactly, that's the magic of the unicorn. <laughs> okay. So for our case study, we will simulate the, the first scenario where we have like a computer that will make a malicious resolution and that then we will do the correlation. So you remember that we created a misbehavior, right? So now we, we will be on a hospital. So we will be on a hospital and we will be the malicious actors that will try to fetch this malware and, and, and deploy the ransomware. This is the event. So uh, remember again, this was the the, uh, the malicious domain that we put in MISP, and this was the malicious uh, IP. Looks like a malicious IP from Annexia, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, as attackers, uh, we went to Darknet, we got easily like credentials, as we has been mentioning many times uh, during these days. Um, and the attacker, what it's gonna do is that, oh, I'm gonna download my malware and deploy the ransom. So, Carl. It's not a real hospital, right? No. <laughs> oh. So we have the Zoom window overlay and how is that thing really fine? Okay. So now we got, now, now we have our malware and the attacker would start deploying uh, all the attack. But let's see on the PDNS SOC of this infrastructure, what we have seen. So basically, um, here, the, this machine inside the hospital uh, has created the query, it went to the DNS, then DNS sent to, um, sent to the PDNS SOC, and now we will have received the detection. So something. So basically, here we have all the information being sent to open search, so we will refresh. Just one detail here. We are using open search. This, those are just JSON logs. I know that you have the resources to use Flank. Our targeted audience surely won't. Yeah, so basically here we see that one minute before, there was an alert on this specific host, which is the hospital host. And we see, OK, this has been all the information. And what was the query? Malicious.com. So if you want to explain the details. Of course. So first, we have to uh, to focus on the fact that we are just acting upon DNS logs, which means that the whole payload.exe uh, detail won't be there. Uh, but in, in this context, we don't care. This is the low-hanging fruit for us. So what happens is that, um, let me scroll a little bit down. So what happens is that here we have the um, uh, Correlated data from MISP uh, generated after matching our uh, detection, our DNS logs. Actually, this is something that I wanted to focus on before, the fact that we still get DNS logs and not passive DNS logs. Passive DNS logs are not time dependent. So uh, the logs that we get here are the uh, DNS logs correlated with MISP threat intelligence. And as you can see, we have 
is called Apple Bit. We have uh, details about the uh, uh, IP that issued this, um, uh, uh, this DNS query. In this case, we have the full IP because we are in the context that we are operating, this is allowed to, but we have options, as you will see later on, to hide this IP in case we want to transmit those logs to another uh, infrastructure. So here is not privacy preserving by design for the demo, but you could have more privacy if you wanted to, and not expose a client that really made a request. So we know what's the query that was issued. We also know the timestamp. We get full context on the answers, which is pretty important. I also mentioned that before, you get the A uh, response now, but you could get different other responses. And this is useful in case uh, there is communication over TXT records, for example, or different other types of uh, DNS uh, response records. And the important part here is that after all those network details, uh, we can get full context of what is matching with, our, with the connected uh, MISP instance. So for example, here, uh, the events that were created, uh, the event that was created before, you can see different uh, details. You can even get the event URL and you already get enough context so that you can, in case you wanted to block or in case you want to act upon this alert, you can already understand why this was added in the first place. And because of my insistence, the, uh, open search is not the only option. You can actually receive an email, uh, which is human readable and have links you can click if you want. Uh, details about the MISP event or, or context about the alert. You can, oh, okay, one second. So we can see the, the email. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. Actually, you can also see just one template of uh, uh, the email that uh, you would be receiving. Of course, this is fully customizable. Uh, and you can see here the comments. So the context, which is pretty important on the MISP uh, uh, side, you can see different tags. You can see all of the connection details that you actually ingested in your local collection to later uh, early reform. And the goal is that you sh must be able to make a determination as to whether or not this is a real problem for you or not very quickly. Like, oh my God, what is this domain? Where does this come from? Is this bad? Is this... And then you have all the information here from MISC uh, from the resolution. Any questions at this point? So the data is first arriving uh, to uh, PDNSOC. And this is important because when the data is uh, traveling to PDNSOC, it's not correlated yet. So correlation happens on PDNSOC. We don't care about uh, uh, the query history. We could care about the raw logs, but we don't care at the moment. So we only care about the correlated logs. Uh, so after the correla correlation is successful, then we're pushing to Elasticsearch, so OpenSearch, whatever. Basically here, on, on, the the alert, on the alert, it can be either an email or it can be like writing a log, a JSON log, for example, and then you have like a file with or whatever that it's pushing to your OpenSearch if you are poor or ex more expensive systems. Uh, yeah, if you have. Uh, I don't know if we're going to come back to that later. I apologize if I spoil it, but... Uh, a lot of people here have the ability to match uh, like domains to malicious. Like if I if I share your malicious domain, I know you have the capability to filter it from now on. Like I have an alert if you see this. But here we also keep the logs on PDNSOC as well for as much space as is available or as much as it's configured, and we do reprocess them. Which means that if you resolve that domain last week, uh, you will get an alarm, right? And that is a very cool feature because in uh, most of the SOC implementation I've seen so far, the alerts are from time zero in the future, but not back in time. And in most of the real life scenarios, you really want to go back in time a little bit uh, because maybe you did the res resolution yesterday and it's already too late. No, it's just... No, but you don't yeah. like all the queries. You know? If you got lots of queries on Elasticsearch, this is pretty bad news because those are only the hits. Those are first only the matches that uh, existed in MISP. And as we will discuss later on, those are not all of the DNS queries. Yeah. 
So, okay. Uh, we, we, can, can it up in the future, or should we do this later on? So, uh, there are we had these uh, uh, performance issues and concerns while building the tool, and uh, we realized that the positioning of the collector is pretty important and uh, determines the amount of data that will be arriving in PDN shop. So we have two ways to tackle this. The first way is to, deplo to deploy multiple PDN shop collectors in different instances. Uh, so we have a, a scaling approach with multiple PDN shop uh, collectors, and this is only made possible because of the fact, sorry, different keyboard. Uh, can you, wait a second, sorry. Uh, can you help me do this? Uh, Next slide. Uh, ah, yeah. OK, so this is only made possible by the fact that our PDN SOC implementation in the collector can also act as a forwarder, which means that specific correlation can happen in one of the PDN SOC instances. Then after filtering, uh, only a specific uh, amount of logs will be arriving in a different other collector. So we, can ha we have fine-grained uh, options there. But apart from that, and this is important, I will travel a lot in the future, but yeah, this we'll is important. Privacy, yeah. OK. so. Skipping privacy for now, uh, we, we observed the following, which is also documented by now. Uh, the positioning of the sensor is pretty important to uh, determine the types of logs that we get. So if you position the collector be, uh, in between your client and your DNS server, you're getting all of the logs. We don't care that much about that. We only care about the cast misses that are happening on the resolver. And this is important because if something resolved once and it's already malicious, uh, the organization should already act upon that and block it. So in this case, we uh, at CERN, for example, we realized that uh, daily we get 1 20th of the logs. So we get only the 5% of the total DNS traffic by observing the cast species. And this is only with that type of filtering. Then we can also apply scaling, as we mentioned before. And, and just a comment here. So just to give you an idea, so we have 60 hospitals forwarding all the DNS data to the most uh, to the smallest machine we have available in OpenStack. So a two cores machine, it's processing the DNS logs of 60 hospitals. In Actually, for the demo, I mean, the worst really is hospitals first because they sent uh, raw logs even from the waiting room. So we had people resolving binaries. I mean, this is really like a good way to filter your input, a good lesson in life. So they were sending all the logs, and, and we tested it for 60 hospital, and it was, we were entering PDNS stock on the Raspberry Pi 4. Just because we had so many questions about, is going to crash? I mean, you need it. So it worked on the Raspberry Pi. And then, uh, yeah, for the open search, it's the smallest VM we could get, basically. Yeah, because we want to remember uh, like, the, the, uh, like the concerns we have initially. So we want to be deployed anywhere by anyone. So basically, anywhere means that with any resources available and anyone without any expertise. So just using configuration files, um, you can deploy all these so, all these systems. So the initial design dogma was uh, no expertise, no money, and done less than five minutes. All right. So let's go back to another important topic. Uh, it's good that we are talking about transferring DNS logs. Uh, from one organization or one infrastructure to the other. But in the end, those are actual logs of clients. And this is pretty important. We don't want to uh, propagate logs of clients. This raises many privacy issues. So in order to tackle this issue, we first need to understand where exactly the personal identifiable information resides during a, a DNS query. So as we discussed earlier with the example.com, uh, a slide. When a client is issuing a DNS query, this DNS query is uh, uh, is handled by the uh, resolver, and then the resolver is uh, uh, forwarding uh, if uh, that's required uh, the query or parts of the query to the authoritative servers. And um, it's important to note that be be between the client and the resolver, there is always identifiable information. Even the client IP is identifiable information. Uh, so uh, in this case, in our organization, there is inherent trust because you're using the resolvers of your uh, organization. So we don't care about those logs. Even though we can support and we can uh, tap on those logs, as we did in the example, if we have the uh, 
agreement with the users that we can tap upon those logs and correlate those. Uh, but we care more, however, we care more about the server-to-server -server communication. So these logs between the resolver and the abstract DNS are the logs that we care about. Those logs are actually the cast misses from the resolver, hence the performance uh, uh, gains that we get that we get from uh, uh, tapping only on those logs. And those logs only include as a client the resolver, which means that an external a collaborative organization won't be able to identify the fact that uh, a client uh, issued a specific DNS query. However, they will be able to know that this query came from this collaborating organization. That's all that they want to know. No, I'm talking about DNS tab data that can be in the DNS tab format, but uh, some things that we we omitted, uh, including in those slides, because we didn't want to dive into technical details, are the fact that DNS tab is not the only format that we support, because it's not available on all of the contexts that we want to actually deploy our tool at. Uh, this sensor. Uh, is an open source element that we use that uh, can consume DNS stuff, can produce DNS stuff, but can consume actually more types of logs leading to DNS stuff data. Which is the collector that we saw in the. Which area. is the collector. So, uh, leading to. Uh, <laughs> To this uh, answer, there are various ways to ensure that uh, only server-to-server -server communication is being uh, correlated. First, there is the DNS tap approach, where you can only log resolver response uh, uh, um, logs, and this is pretty important uh, because if DNS tap is available, this is the most performant way to do so. But if, not, if that's not available, then we also offer filtering on the sensor side. So you can add your recursors list. And uh, these uh, logs will be the only logs that will be forwarded upon. You can do multiple different anonymization uh, steps here that we will also talk about later on. Uh, so we offer two cases, because DNS tab is not something that everybody can uh, introduce to their uh, infrastructure. So to, to, as a small parenthesis, we, we talked to Paul Vixi, Farsight Security Domain Tools, about this. And uh, we realized quickly DNS tap was like the main solution proposed, but it's really tricky because they were like, all you have to do is recompile your bin binary on your server. And it's like, if you're a developer, it's fine. If you work with a physics lab or a large organization, uh, they're not going to do it. Uh, they're going to, you know, it's going to be over the dead body. They're going to use a vanilla a binary they get from their distribution because they're going to warranty and they're going to have all sorts of problems. Um, so it has to come out of the box, more or less. And just to be precise, this was one of the problems. But there is another problem is that even if you ask for update of a DNS server, this will take ages for some organizations. DNS servers should work forever. Nobody should touch DNS. That's the mantra of all of the uh, organizations that we have uh, collaborated with. So we offer different ways to mask the client IP in case uh, DNS tap is not available, or uh, even the resolvers shouldn't be there uh, in the first place. So we can just uh, mask part of the IP. We can replace the client IP with a sensor ID that is issued by us, so that we can maintain a list of different sensors that are operate that are forwarding data to our correlation engine. And uh, we also have the uh, uh, the functionality to hash the client IP, which is also important because sometimes we don't want the uh, IP but we want to have a way to match a log entry with a specific client at a specific time. So why this is important for your organizations? Uh, because there will be some organizations that you want to know the specific computer that did that query, right? So in this case, you really want to know the IP associated to that resolution. That's fine. But for example, if there is a small organization, a small institute somewhere, and it says to CERN, hey, you have a lot of expertise with MIPS. We don't want to deploy that. So we will send you all the DNS query. But they don't want to say to share the specific computer that did that. So basically, they will they will say something like, "I either hash it, um, so then once you send me this information, I will know what is the computer, or they will just share, "Hey, I'm the University X from whatever." So they they will use the name. So then you contact them and they will investigate. So, so how does that uh, work with market data? Because all organizations they can't want to go DNS. Yep. 
well, you can still configure the way you want. Um, the, and the point here is more like if you um, if you have multiple levels, like you want to hide, sorry, don't fall. We need you. Uh, so like, like you want to anonymize either of the clients, uh, you can just uh, generate uh, alerts or messages that are more anonymized. Or if you want to pass on the data from your own PDNS SOC that you have somewhere else in the cloud to somebody else, and then you don't want them to know about your actual clients. Like in, in your case, yes, that it could be like you forward uh, anonymized data to somebody else's PDNS SOC because they have, the purpose would be like they have another misp instance you don't have access to. Like you have friends that are super cool Intel, but you don't want to expose the actual um, users in the SNET. So you just send anonymized data and then say, hey, Kapil, we have an alert and this is a um, query um, ID. Then we don't know who that is, but then you will have to do the reverse lookup and say, oh my God, this is this particular user we need to contact. Yeah, and something that we have realized in the process of presenting the, uh, the solution to uh, the organization and to the community is that we see that every time there is more interest for CSER teams that have to coordinate with different organizations to even deploy a DNS plus RPZ. Because many institutes didn't even think about that, right? It's like, yes, we use the whatever public. So we don't care about using the public one or using the CSER team that we know that they will do that. So we, what we see is that sometimes PDNSOC we, uh, comes with the volunteer uh, to deploy a DNS RPZ and do both, the, the reaction and the detection. It's funny, in 2023, in the age of DOH, DOT, to rely on DNS for security, but in some cases it works. In our community, we could have some success. It doesn't solve all the problems, but again, low-hanging fruit, very easy. And a lot of visibility, because if you deploy the DNS for multiple organizations, then you will have visibility across all of those organizations. Um, so as soon as we detect something at CERN, we share it with the main CSER, and then 10 organizations will be patched um, at the second. So. so moving forward, we already had some discussion on how to fine tune the ingestion of data, how to scale up. And um, this fine tuning is both for the um, it's both for the data size that is arriving your correlation engine, but it's also about the false positives. And this is pretty important. People are not exactly patient with uh, many false positives. So we already talked about the sensor positioning. Uh, just to recap, it's pretty important to understand whether you need the full picture or you only need the CAS misses. Because if you already act upon your DNS server, if you already block uh, malicious uh, domains or IPs that you are receiving, then uh, it may be better to act only upon the cast misses. But apart from that, we have realized that um, uh, false positives uh, are a huge issue. And uh, even if we uh, develop the best tool out there, if there are more than a couple of or three false positives uh, in the alerts, everybody will sigh off. We are back to the point where uh, MIS for PDNS so are just tools, empty shells, and it all depends on the people you work with, and they are humans, and so sometimes they make mistakes. And you have to choose your friend, but sometimes even your own good friends make mistakes. So this uh, uh, defined tuning in terms of false positives uh, uh, is uh, separated in two different uh, uh, action fields. First, it's MISP and how you uh, actually uh, get your hands on your intelligence. And then it's consuming from the tool named MISP. So in terms of uh, MISP terminology, there are different ways to uh, reduce false positives. For example, there are the warning lists. And uh, uh, it's uh, pretty useful to set up some default ones at least. And then it's also useful to maintain warning lists with your community, especially if you're a mature enough organization. Then the uh, IDS flag that uh, uh, Pauk uh, enabled before is pretty important. This is the only flag that you will be using in the end for uh, determining whether this should be automated or not. And then even if all of those are in place, uh, there are different smart approaches that uh, you could have. I'm not sure whether this is visible, but uh, I can explain. Um, in order to consume IOCs uh, with an efficient way. So uh, the, uh, the attributes that are included in MISP are uh, tagged with different uh, metadata. And there are specific uh, metadata uh, tags that uh, need to be handled forever, but there are others that become stale pretty fast. So for example, open source lists uh, become stale pretty fast. So this means that you shouldn't take into account open source lists for 
exactly more than 30 days. However, an IOC flagged with an APT uh, a tag seems to be pretty important, so this may need to be consumed forever. This actually reduced our false positive rates to the minimum. And we realized yesterday that there are others that had exactly the same thought, which so is pretty it's, confirming. So it's actually not specific to PDNS stock, it is just our approach with MISP, is that uh, is to acknowledge the fact that uh, not all data is equal. So if you have uh, uh, events that are related to threats, like, like typical cybercrime of the shelf using, I don't know, AWS, uh, you don't want to get this data for a year because, of course, Amazon will clean the IP within one or two days. So if you keep having alarm time for 30 days, it's going to be really a false positive and really annoying. So for this type of uh, malware, maybe one or two days exporting the data to your RPZ, to your Zeek uh, or PDNS stock is, is sufficient. But if your own government tells you this nation state is coming from that IP and that domain, uh, which is like something very specific in a country, Maybe you want to keep that for a year, right? And if you have false, false positive, tough luck. I mean, you can report it, or but maybe you want to have, to have different speeds or different uh, way you treat the data. And this is basically just an implementation of that uh, technology. We do it with Zeek and, and other things. So we do it in PDNS stock as well. This is a configuration that is completely uh, flexible. So the tags can be whatever uh, is popular under your MISP uh, propagation server. Well, you can say, if um, I hear about the black hole ransomware gang, I want to keep it forever. But if it's like random data coming from Tau that has a label, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, rat APT or something, then I would like to discard it within two days. <laughs> so finalizing, uh, so finishing our presentation, uh, our current status is that we have uh, uh, our tool open source that under the CERN CERT uh, 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 GitHub organization. This is fully open source. We actually side off other sensors that were not open source and took the long run of implementing stuff ourselves. Uh, so I, I want to say at this point, we tried and we're still cooperating really hard with Domain Tool and Five Size Security because they're doing a lot of work in this area as well and they have expertise. So we don't know where this partnership is going to go, but uh, we have uh, like I can't say working group with them. I think it's fair enough to say that now, uh, where we're trying to discuss how we can get da DNS data from users and, and clients in a way that is mainstream. We do not want to maintain uh, a, a tool to collect a client to connect DNS logs. So we either take something off the shelf, like we do today, slightly modified, or uh, somebody else does it. So, so far, we are using uh, uh, a pretty well known tool in the community called GoDNS Collector. And uh, it's. Uh... It's a huge omission, but uh, without this tool, PDNSOC wouldn't be here today. And uh, currently, we are deploying PDNSOC, PDNSOC in various organizations. And we are collecting feedback. Most of the things and most of the fine tuning that you see here was not exactly our idea. It was feedback from the community, and we strive to get more feedback. And the future is uh, ahead. We are uh, trying to. Uh, make this tool as, uh, as uh, approachable as possible for small organizations. We also try to uh, forward after filtering our data to uh, passive DNS databases. And this is pretty important because we think that passive DNS is a pretty useful tool uh, for threat hunting. And uh, the open source nature of our tool is there only to uh, build a community so that we are not the only ones maintaining this and we get more feedback about uh, the tool. So we get strong interest by a number of uh, national CSERT, NRANs, and other communities to use the tool and deploy it. But at the moment, the, the, the future of development and maintenance is really a, a problem. So if you're like young technical people interested in looking at the code and uh, contributing or maintaining it, I'd be most welcome at this point. That's all. So we have quick time for discussion. Yeah, so we're going to finish early. So you can have a few questions before you go. So while you're thinking about the question, I have a gift for Christos. And actually, he doesn't know that. But um, 
Uh, I have a, a Swiss watch I would like to give you and thank you for your effort in the, in the unicorn uh, product that you've helped develop. So here I have here this wonderful Swiss watch uh, as a unicorn for you. <laughs> thank you, Christos. I hope you wear it. I'm confused, by, but grateful. Eh? <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, The answer is totally yes. Actually, before being able to uh, use the GoDNS collector uh, for the certain uh, needs, we ingested data from Zeek. Okay. So Ashish uh, already looked into it and has written the right. Uh, and we we are case. collaborating. This will happen, and uh, we just need to find more people or more organizations that are interested in this because we try to prioritize our inputs and outputs. This is the first thing that fails for open source projects if we try to support everything. Uh, but in any case, we also, apart from DNS tab, we support different other options. We either support AF packet sniffing which is not as performant, but in case you do not have access to the DNS server, but you have access to a tap device or a span device, this is also an option for you. To extend this a little bit, we even support uh, OpenWRT devices. Uh, so it's some, <laughs> some say we even support uh, telnetting uh, raw DNS logs in syslog formats. I've heard that somewhere. Not our brightest moment. <laughs> Any other question? All right. If not, thank you for coming, and uh, we hope to see you uh, somewhere online.